Welcome to this meeting. My name is John Meadley. I'm uh, chair of the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. I'm the stand in chair for this uh, particular session for, for reasons which I'll explain. Just a bit of introduction. Um, you may be as puzzled as I am by the increasing incidence of, of sickness uh, that we have today um, that barely existed in post, when I was a boy, post war UK, when our diet was much simpler and the standard of medical care was much lower. Um, there was very little heart disease, cancer, diabetes, asthma and Alzheimer's. And I can't help thinking that this reflects the increased level of chemicals in our environment, which was highlighted first by Rachel Carson in, in Silent Spring, and the significant change that had happened in our diet. In particular, the recommendation to replace animal fats with vegetable oils, which has seriously influenced what farmers produce. Um, and also the um, uh, reduction in the consumption of milk um, and the, the introduction of low-fat milk, which meant there's a lot of cream on the world market and there was no market for that cream. That's one of the things that actually reduced the price of milk and allowing sugar intake to, to increase. Now, five years ago, I met a local GP in Stroud, a guy called Ian Lake. Like me, he's a, a keen uh, cyclist. And he's also a, a type 1 diabetic of 20 years ago. And I learned from him that in Stroud District, where I live, there are 300 known pre-diabetics. That is, the medical profession know there are 300 people who are, are about to become uh, diabetics. But there are no incentives for the doctors to address this, despite this huge uh, human and financial cost of them becoming full-blown uh, diabetics. So we looked into the opportunities for preventative um, health care and uh, we made a small gesture which and it took us two and a half years but we've got cycling on prescription <laughs> in Stroud district so now if people have problems with uh, weight heart and other things they can actually have a trainer on the National Health Service to get them back um, on their bikes now um, <coughs> Uh, Ian is um, he's actually given up being a full time GP he's now a locum and he's committing himself to um, preventative health care and he's currently co-writing uh, for Diabetes UK um, uh, a diet to convert to high fat uh, he's also a member of the PFLA he's a doctor and a member of the PFLA which I think is important and interested in the relationship between food and farming so that's why by way of, of, of background how we come to be here and, and um, I introduced Ian to Derwin Banks here who is um, a farmer with a fascination with the relationship between facts and health which you'll hear about and which he's living out on the linseed farm um, and we approached uh, the, the ORFC for a slot to talk about understanding facts and Richard was going to be chair and Ian sadly his father has died and he's not able to be with us so Richard has stepped into the breach brilliantly, and I'm afraid you've got me as chair, um, and he's agreed, um, agreed to take his place. Now our first speaker is Richard. Um, <coughs> I don't think Richard needs much introduction, but just let me say, um, he's been involved very much in the early days of the organic movement, together with Patrick, who is uh, Patrick Holden, who's here, um, and the Soil Association, chair of the British Organic Farmers, chairman of the Soil Association Symbol Committee, and Livestock Standards Committee in the 1980s, editor of the, new journal, of the journal New Farmer and Grower, then deputy director of British Organic Farmers um, and the Organic Growers Association. He's now policy director of the Sustainable Food Trust, where he's campaigned against the misuse of antibiotics in agriculture and made studies on agriculture and greenhouse gases, the underlying cause of bovine tuberculosis and Yonas disease, and most recently on the role of fats in our diet, which is why we're really happy that he's here. And, and Richard farms with his sister, Rosamond, uh, 390 acres in Worcestershire, um, in, in the Cotswolds. Richard, over to you. Thank you very much. I am a member of the Pasture Fed Livestock yes. Association as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, a few years ago, um, I was at a reception with a food campaigner called Jeanette Longfield, who I've worked with over many years. She retired quite recently. Um, and we've, we've campaigned on a number of issues together and we've, we've, we're good friends 
and um, we were at a reception before a fundraising dinner in a director's dining room at the top of a very posh building and there was an almost completely white carpet on the floor and she'd been talking for a moment or two to me and then um, she said to me what would you think the single most important thing we could do to improve the health of the nation would be? And then as she asked that question, she took a fairly large sip of red wine. And I said, eat more saturated fat. And <laughs> she, she said, considerable self-control, because she wrestled for about 20 seconds with her mouth full of red wine before she was able to swallow it. And it didn't actually end up on the carpet. What I should have said at the time was also eat less vegetable oil, because... It's only recently that I've come to realise just how harmful and just how incredibly mistaken we've been in what we've done over the last um, f four or five decades in relation <coughs> to fats. And essentially what we've done is we've replaced the fats of grassland, which we can produce in this country on the 70% of UK farmland that's in grass, with the fats of Indonesian rainforest in S Southeast Asia, in the Amazon and now increasingly in, in equatorial Africa. And the devastation that's been caused for us to change to those, the, 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 we're, we're losing all the great apes in Southeast Asia, we're probably going to lose them in uh, Central Africa as well, if the current trends continue. But the damage, the carbon going into the atmosphere, the pollution, the effects on local people, is absolutely devastating. Um, Okay, very quickly, um, what's happened, we've moved from animal fats to vegetable oils, we've moved from saturated fats to polyunsaturated fats, we've moved from visible fats to invisible fats, and that's quite an important point. We used to see the fats that we're eating, now most of them are hidden in processed foods. And we've moved from natural fats to industrially altered fats. Here's some statistics from the US, which actually shows that between 1909 and 2000, the amount of polyunsaturated fat that was coming from meat and fish fell from 32% to 14%, but the amount coming from vegetables increased from 32% to 72%. What's significant about this also, just worth noting, is that even back in 1909, we were getting 40% of our saturated fat from vegetable oil. People tend to forget that all fats contain the whole balance. It's just how much they have and how much you consume. And today, most of our saturated fats as you'll see here, are coming from vegetable oils. And that's just a shot of the implications. The devastation for palm oil, the way in which soya beans and corn oil are produced in so many parts of the world, this is in South America here. And here is oilseed rape being grown in this country. The problems with it, the, the monoculture aspect is starving insects. The fact that it's a crop that needs a lot of insecticides and fungicides is killing off pollinating insects. Um, it is one of the better oils in terms of the balance of fats. We'll come to that in a moment, or being well. Soya beans, I just want to make this point, give you an example of soya beans, because we hear campaigners from the vegetarian movement <coughs> and elsewhere telling us that the soya bean problem is entirely to do with intensive livestock production and the use of soya bean meal in, in livestock feed. Now, I'm the last person to say anything in defence of the intensive livestock sector, but I try to follow the evidence when I find it. And what it's true, only 11 to 19 percent of the crop ends up as oil, which goes for human consumption, and 80 percent or so of the crop ends up used in agriculture. However, we humans are using 99 percent of that soybean oil because we're no longer we're burning beef fat around the back of abattoirs, and so we've got this insatiable demand for more fat. And if we weren't using that soybean, we'd even be destroying even more rainforest to create the, um, the, 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 the uh, palm oil. Um, and that 99%, 80% of it goes into food, um, about 90, 18 or 9% is used in biodiesel, and 1 or 2% is used in cosmetics and fly spray. So actually, it's not the intensive livestock sector that's behind the dis dis devastation caused by soybean production, it's actually we humans. And that's what most people are not willing to accept. Um, this, now, given how much damage all this is causing to the environment, you think we might be getting some benefits from it. However, every day, 515 people in this country still go to hospital with a heart attack, uh, and 190 of those die. 
A further 245 people who died from other forms of cardiovascular disease, uh, things like strokes and so on. 7 million people are living with cardiovascular disease because we've got better <coughs> treatments so we can keep people alive better these days. Two thirds of adults and 25% of children, and this includes me, are overweight or obese in this country. Uh, 3.6 3 million people are suffering from type 2 diabetes. Uh, that's up from 1.4 million just 20 years ago. Huge increase in dementia, obesity and type 2 diabetes, and I'll try to show in a moment how those are linked to the vegetable consumption. And all this despite the fact that there's been 80% fall per person in the use of tobacco in this country since the early <laughs> 1960s. There are 5 million blood pressure medications which are far superior today to they were at that time and people are taking them more reliably. And there are 92,000 coronary interventions, that's things like coronary heart bypass operations, before people even have a heart attack. And what's really staggering, we don't even have any data in the UK for the incidence of coronary heart disease. We know how many people die from it, we know what the prevalence is in society, but we do not even gather national data on how many people get a heart attack. Now, the key drivers of this have been basically a chap called Ansel Key, some of you may have heard of him, who had this hunch that it was to do with fat, and later he believed it was saturated fat. Back in the early 1950s, his research appealed to the sugar industry. They put a billion pounds a year into trying to prove his lipid hypothesis, which was linking uh, these issues. And we also got quite significant misdirection from the vegetables industry, who saw back as early as the 1958 that they were the, the, the trans fats that they were producing were a potential problem um, and they very much liked the idea of putting the blame on animal fats. And also you could say the rise of vegetarianism and veganism has actually contributed to the problem, not to help to solve it. Now this is data from the UK showing how coronary heart disease rose during the 20th century. I've had to fudge the first part because actually we don't have reliable government data for coronary heart disease mortality from before 1959, but there are studies and other sources that give us some indication. And what's particularly notable is how around about 1930, 1920s, when we were getting almost all our fats from animal sources, the incidence of coronary heart disease was incredibly low. And it's actually, when you look at the statistics, so it's, I'll show you in a moment to do a graph, I hope, which will show a bit more clearly. Um, here's Ansel Keys on the front of Time magazine in 1961, being promoted as the saviour of the human race, pointing out that we all had to um, move away from saturated fat towards polyunsaturated fat. And what he did was he, 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 he found that in Japan, the people in Japan had very low incidence of coronary heart disease, they had a very low consumption of fat and saturated fat. <coughs> In the US, he found, noted that people had a high incidence of coronary heart disease and they had a low consumption of saturated fat. And he thought, aha, I want to something here. And I mean, that's not an unreasonable thing to, 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 to do for scientists. But he then picked five or six other countries to fit very neatly on a straight line to show this correlation. However, a, few, a couple of years later, some scientists actually put the full data on and they showed that if you publish the full data, you don't actually get that clear correlation between fat and um, <coughs> coronary heart disease. However, by the time he published this, this was published, the problem was already too late because the sugar industry had jumped on this and the bandwagon was rolling and there were scientists all over the world being paid to prove the lipid hypothesis. And if you're paid to prove something, you'll keep on trying to do that. What Keyes didn't do, he didn't even look at sugar in the diet. Um, First, actually worth noting, the very first medical description of a heart attack was in 1926. It wasn't until 1954 that the World Health Organization called its first expert meeting to look at what was causing heart attacks. Keyes put his um, hypothesis to, to the committee and they laughed him out of the room. And he went back to the US with a bee in his bonnet, managed to raise a huge amount of money and then conducted his seven country study which has appeared to prove what he believed. In 1954, based, I think, on Key's original research, we got fat grading introduced in the UK. Um, and in, as early as 1961, the American Heart Association started recommending that people increase their consumption of polyunsaturated fats, uh, basically both from vegetable oils, without really any solid evidence to base that on. But this is very interesting data. This is from Dr. Walter Yellowlees, who, a friend of mine who died a couple of years ago, age 96, 
He was the founder of the Macarius Society, a member of the Soil Association, and a doctor in the, um, the wilderness, as he called it, in Scotland, who was writing articles from as early as 1970 to show that we, were, we should be eating animal fats and not vegetable oils. Now, this comes from Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, where he, a friend of his who produces data. In the first part of the 1920s, between 1920 and 1920, there wasn't a single case, of a, wasn't a single heart attack in the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. And then over the next few years, they increased that dramatically. And at this point, we were eating entirely animal fats. Now, I've had to use US data here because there is no data for the UK on fat in the UK food chain throughout the whole of the last century. But just if you look at this, um, the saturated fat <coughs> is this blue, the red line here, and it stays more or less flat throughout the whole of the 20th century. There is a, a significant increase in fat consumption overall, but that's basically due to the increased consumption of polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats. However, even these changes in saturated fat, you have to bear in mind that this is, you've got palm oil for example coming in and replacing um, um, animal fats, so it's not exactly the same sources of fat that we're getting all the way through. So if we plot these against the, I'm having to use here US data against UK coronary heart disease, which is a bit naughty, the actual um, US data for coronary heart disease, a very similar graph, I haven't had time to refine this. Um, but you can see, I think it's even a child would find it difficult to say how can we link something which is staying roughly flat in the, in the food chain with a, such a dramatic rise. And one of the members of a kitty committee who became a friend of mine, perhaps called Professor Michael Oliver, who actually told us initially, agreed with the committee that saturated with fat was a problem, later changed his mind and said he, he got it wrong. Um, he pointed out that really one of the major factors was the smoking during the First and Second World War. Five million servicemen being given free cigarettes throughout the whole of the war became addicted tobacco to tobacco. Um, it wasn't the only factor, but it was certainly one of the main ones. Now, what's been happening over the last... Well, here's your, uh, Walter Yellow book in 1993, um, making, making, in three chapters, making a very strong case that we've got it wrong. And all these books, the ones that I'd recommend, there are many others, these are authors who are starting to tell us um, in no uncertain terms, very detailed um, publications, all referenced that we've got it wrong, that we've been misinterpreting the studies and so on and so forth. Um, now, that's me in 2009 in the Bristol Royal Infirmary after suffering um, what's called an aortic dissection. That's a split in my main aorta, which is a type of cardiovascular disease. There were multiple reasons for that, but I believe that the fact that I'd actually moved on to a vegetable diet, mistakenly, stupidly, believing the government recommendations, I'd put on about half a stone of weight in my 50s, and I was trying to lose that weight. Um, I actually put on a lot of weight, um, and I ended up in um, intensive care, and I almost didn't make it. I've got a stent. Um, like Bill Clinton, that's the only thing we've got in common, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, um, anyway, so I almost became part of the, the mortality statistics, but fortunately I was only part of the morbidity statistics. Now, this is sugar consumption. Now, right back into the Victorian era, the early, if we go back a little bit further on this, the consumption of sugar in about 19, 1810 was only about £10 per head per year. By the time that Queen Victoria died in 1900, it was around about 100 weight per, you know, 100 pounds plus per person per year. Tenfold increase in sugar consumption. Now, this is a reduction during the two world wars because we couldn't import as much sugar as we had been, um, and then it's risen again since then. And if you look, if we now put that against the, I've had to squeeze it up a bit, the coronary heart disease mort mortality death rates from coronary heart disease, You've got a very similar pattern, but what this is is 30 or 40 years earlier. But then, isn't that what you'd expect? You don't drop dead from coronary heart disease if you adopt a diet, bad diet today. It takes almost a lifetime of, of, of eating badly before you start to find the effects. However, I don't think sugar's the only factor. I think vegetable oils also need to be factored in this, to this. And a few other things, like the 19... 12, the very first breakfast cereals from Kellogg's, which had all the goodness mashed out of them, um, 
we also get in 1890 the introduction of steel roller mills and taking out even more of a brand so we're getting extra white flour which all these factors are contributing to this problem but I think sugar and vegetables are two, the two main ones. Now the committee, the key committee which told us that we should reduce our subsumation saturated fat, 10 man committee set up in a great hurry um, urged by the Department of Health and Social Security to get answers because Geoffrey Cannon brilliantly had exposed the fact of suppressed government report which was saying that fat, sugar and um, salt were the problems. Um, uh, he, he, he exposed this and um, got a lot of publicity. He's now changed his mind, by the way, I'll tell you. But um, what it said was we should be used to the consumption of, consumption of saturated fatty acids, asterisk. Everybody's just forgotten the asterisk. If you look at the footnotes, what it says is includes trans fats. And what happened was that we had this big campaign to reduce the consumption of um, saturated fats, but the consumption of trans fats from vegetables went up. Um, three members of that committee were paid consultants of the sugar industry. They didn't have to declare their interests. A fourth, Professor Philip James, had, was getting industry funding, sugar, uh, food industry funding. Um, two, one member of the committee wouldn't sign up to it, an independent scientist from Nottingham University, Professor Michael Oliver, withdrew later. So we've got a committee which we completely based our food policy and our and our dietary policy on the recommendations of this committee and when you actually look at the members it's a very dodgy makeup. Um, Japan, if, 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 if Keys had looked, the consumption of, of sugar in Japan was also incredibly low just like it was of saturated <coughs> fat. This is just worth reading, this is um, from a sugar industry uh, meeting in 1983 in Johannesburg, they didn't know there was somebody taking notes in there who wasn't from within the thing. There's a hidden agenda in the research support business. Those who accept your support are often perceived to be less likely to give you a bad scientific press. They may come up with results that cause you problems, but they will put them in, a co in the context in a way that leaves you happier than had they emanated from someone not receiving your support. It takes a lot to bite the hand that feeds you. A muzzle is a good insurance against unwelcome bites. Now that's Professor John Reed inside the sugar industry talking to sugar industry executives who are going to be handing out grants to researchers to try to prove the lipid hypothesis. Um, I'll have to rush through now because I know there's, there's what's happening now though we are starting to get studies now which are confirming the research of all these scientists. Two recent ones the Sydney Heart study in the 1960s early 1970s in middle aged men the incredible thing about these two studies is that full results were not published they were suppressed it's now been shown that those who were on the low saturated fat diet and on the increased vegetables uh, diet had a higher all-cause mortality and were more likely to die from heart attack than those who had the vegetable diet as uh, so the state on the nor normal diet and the Minnesota coronary experiment has just been published um, the, the update of it double blind randomized nine and a half thousand men and women wide range of ages the key data at the time was not published the, the vegetable oil group had they had a reduced blood cholesterol level by 13.8 cent but this, this group had higher incidence of coronary heart disease not lower incidence of coronary heart disease so we've been widely misled about the actual research findings <coughs> so my conclusion is we've got most things wrong this is a Dutch scientist who's saying this is just looking at the, the, the carbohydrate aspect of it, total body of evidence suggests that attention should be shifted away from harmful effects of dietary saturated fatty acids per se to prevention and accumulation of saturated fats in the body lipids, that body fats that is, to shift the would emphasis with the importance of reducing dietary carbohydrate, especially carbohydrate with a high glycemic interest, rather than reducing dietary saturated fatty acids. <coughs> now I probably better stop there, I don't know, John, because and people can look at the rest of the slides or do you want me to go on for another couple of minutes? Another couple of minutes. Okay. I think people are here to learn from you. Okay, so this is just to, this is just to show you how vegetables have been prom promoted rather like engine oils. They'll run through your engine as <laughs> clean as a whistle, not clog up your arteries. Um, and this is just shows how the vegetarian <laughs> section think that they are so convinced that, that animal fats are harmful that they, they can have these sort of spoof advertisements of this sort. Um, now, what's wrong with vegetables? Very quickly... Soybean, rape oil, corn oil, they're 
Uh, they all contain essential fatty acids, that's good, they, which we need, we can't get from other sources, but they contain, uh, and also the, the, the omega-6, the vegetable oils, do re reduce cholesterol, bad cholesterol, but some of the bad cholesterol we now know is essential to us, and so actually reducing it is not a necessarily a good idea. But, but the real issue with these is a ratio between the two essential fatty acids is extremely unhealthy. Soybeans, olive oil, corn oil, and even olive oil, corn oil, and cotton seed and sunflower oil contain a ratio of 8 to 1, 10 to 1, 54 to 1, 58 to 1, and 199 times to 1, as much omega-6 as omega-3. Rape oil has got about roughly even amounts, that's why I said it's one of the better ones, but it's got huge issues to do with its production. But even with rape oil, you've got to bear in mind that the omega-3 is only in the form of alpha-linolenic acid. <coughs> and that, um, alpha-linolenic acid, sorry, that's basic omega-3. Only about 5 to 8% of that converts into the long-chain omega-3 fatty acids that we actually need for health. So you don't get that much, anything like you do if you're getting your, your fats from animal sources. And palm oil contains omega-6, but no omega-3 at all. It's also got more saturated fat than beef <coughs> fat. Um, but the key point is that omega-6 um, linoleic acid converts to arachidonic acid, um, which causes the release of prostaglandins and other substances which cause inflammation. And there's now building research to suggest that these are one of the key causes of a whole range of diseases, including dementia. Um, where have we got to? Yes, there's a whole problem of all these vegetables have to be hardened before they go into the, into the food system. That used to cause trans fats, it still does to some extent. They're now using a process called interestification, where they break things down into their original molecules and they actually move the fats around to create designer fats. Um, they've got another process called fractionization. All vegetables that contain residues of the solvents that are used to extract them, like hexane, um, and also the catalysts, aluminium and nickel, which are quite toxic. Um, so, in my view, not terribly good for us. Um, that's me in nine. So there were consequences for farming. <laughs> that's me in 1953 on one of my father's Wessex saddleback sows the year before the government introduced fat grading and basically got rid of every free-range herd of British pigs in this country because they had high levels of back fat. I'd suggest that's just what we needed because we could be using that back fat from, from those animals to replace vegetables. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. That's stunning. And Richard only knew a few days he was going to give this <laughs> talk. So I show there's a depth of knowledge there which has just flowed, for which we're, 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 we're very grateful. I think the interesting thing to me particularly is this question of the balance. <coughs> I'm pretty ignorant about this, but omega-6 to omega-3 is the key issue. And one of the interesting things for me with, with pasture-fed cattle is that omega-3 and omega-6 seems to be more or less in balance. And this is one of the advantages of raising cattle this way. 